And here we go again with another episode of Dirt to Dust presented by Outlaw Offroad. We are back for another Wednesday drop of hopefully your favorite podcast ever, 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 Dirt to Dust. We like being here. We hope you do too. So we've got a new topic for this week that we're going to get right after this week. Um, we are just a couple of days away. In fact, by the time you're probably watching this episode, I, cross my fingers, should be in a fire suit in a race car in 4699, uh, either setting up, practicing, and or racing, depending on uh, when you're watching. So we wanted to take the opportunity, consider now this is kind of the start of the actual race season for us. We're going to Kentucky, Bowling Green, Kentucky, Beach Bend uh, Speedway. It's a short course race. Not, it's like the exact opposite of King of the Hammers. So I know we kind of kicked off 2024 uh, with doing the episode about KOH. So now we're going to talk about uh, the other Ultra Four. Kind of what makes up the meat of the schedule is, you know, the shorter stuff, that three, four, five mile course, that eight, nine, 10 mile course, not the desert stuff that we race a lot, uh, that we do race a lot on the West Coast, but that we race on the East Coast, the shorter stuff. So looking forward to getting into that. So we're going gonna to take this opportunity to do an episode on prep how we prep i think a lot of people think we just kind of prep it like a regular off-road vehicle we go out there you know we drop the tire pressures we tighten everything down and we just go and nothing could be further from the truth i wish that was the truth um but it's not so we are going to take an episode we're going to talk about it we're going to discuss it uh, a little bit of the verses uh, a little bit of the differences and all of that good stuff i got my good friend here caleb forbes along for the ride on doing the co-host duties today so without further ado Let's jump right into this episode. When other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to, to Dust. Us. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. <laughs> All right, so let's hit the ground running here. Uh, I kind of already told everybody what we're talking about, a little, little Ultra 4 action. Uh, we've got the race this weekend, April 20th, at Beach Bend Raceway in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And and this is in Bowling Green, Kentucky. This is not like where we normally go where, oh, it's in, it's in you know, Bowling Green, Kentucky, but we're like an hour outside of it in the middle of daggone nowhere. <laughs> in no, the no. middle of two mountains and yeah, we're like five minutes from Walmart. behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Like I can go and get like some Chick Fil A. Like it's right there, right there. And wow. For me, man, I'm looking forward to going. I grew up right down the road um, from this race course in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, right outside of Fort Campbell. Really, spent a lot of years there. Yeah, yeah, a lot of years there in Southwest Kentucky. Um, so I can't wait to get back there. I got a lot of friends in that area that are still there uh, as adults, and it's a short course, which is really, really. Um, helpful and beneficial to us having a very fast high horsepower vehicle um it is very helpful if mm -hmm. for those of you who may remember may not we went to crandon last year and we had two races in two days we did the red cup there or the red cup it actually is the red cup the red bull <laughs> world cup uh, short course world cup um on a friday night race mm -hmm. and then we did the ultra four crandon race the following night on saturday and we took home third and second respectively and we did that not having uh, to apply brakes because they were locked up. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure Friday you sent me a picture. Were uh, up. Yeah, you sent me a picture at one the, point. Have you seen pictures? They were, they were on fire. The they fronts were, literally caught fire. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> so Friday night, the fronts locked up. And um, try racing while slamming on your brakes. Like, it's not fun. Mm -mm. But we still ended up getting a third out of that. And then we thought that was fixed. We fixed it. We replaced a bunch of stuff. And then the rears did it the following night. The fronts were great, but the rears did it. So it felt like I was kind of pulling a trailer. Mm -hmm. um, not as bad as the fronts being locked up. So with that, we were able to kind of give Bailey a coal a run for his money. Once we kind of, I, I basically was just told by my spotter, if it burns to the ground, it burns to the ground, go. <laughs> just and we go. made some passes and took the second. <laughs> uh, he actually lied to me. He actually told me the brakes were getting better. 
So <laughs> he said, no, they're, they're getting better. I think they released and you should go, go, go like all gas. Like it was yeah. like F1 radio. Cause I was pissed. I was, it was not family friendly <laughs> on the radio. I was pissed. I was like, are you effing kidding me again? We didn't fix this. Like this is, I was, I was hot and he just got sick of hearing me. So he lied straight to me and said, no, 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 it's like lap four. It's, it's, like, oh, it's getting better. It's getting better. It's good. Uh, it's all good. gas, go, 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 push, push. And I did push, push. I pushed, pushed. And uh, we ended up going from fourth to second in like a lap and a half. And um, we got we got past two other guys. I think it was Lauren Healy was one guy we passed. And then Brexton Glines was another mm-hmm. guy we passed. And Brexton actually blew a tire trying to stay with, trying to, trying to stay with us going into the back section. And then we lost him. And Lauren did the same when we were, we were I think we were kind of pushing him. And he blew a tire, unfortunately for him, and they're able to pass, and we did not give that position back. Um, yeah. Our tires stayed well, that's up. That's the cool we part good. about short course racing is. I love it. So, love it. like with hammers, you typically see, especially the guys that can get out in front of the traffic jam, they're, they're miles or hours gone. in gone. front of everybody. Yeah. Um, whereas a short course, the demands and like basically forces you to stay all with each other. Cause you're not going to get three laps ahead of you, uh, of somebody up there. You're just not going to do it. No. Um, I mean, we lapped a couple, but that's as much as you're lapping. Like I, I think I yeah, got lapped by lap one 4,800 car. Cause at Crandon, mm-hmm. we were racing with the 45s, us 46s right. and the 48s. And Bailey and I ended up a top 10 overall. Uh, I think we were sixth and seventh or seven and eighth overall, all classes in the entirety of the EMC challenge. And there was like, I don't know, 40 some cars out there. So there's some fast cars in the 4600 class, and fortunately for us and Bailey, you know, we were two of them. We were two of them up there battling for it. Bailey up there battling for a top five, and we were both well in the top ten. Uh, I think Lauren even came in. Lauren made a pass on the last lap and ended up coming in mm-hmm. like ninth or something overall. So right. two Broncos and a Jeep up there in the top ten with the the <clears throat> real big the big boys. So um, this yeah, year a little different. Uh, 4800s are going to get their own race. We did just find that out. So we will okay. be racing awesome. with the 4500s. Uh, mm-hmm. on Saturday afternoon. So I think the and this schedule was just released so this is new this is new news. Um uh I think we're going to get uh 1 hour or so on Friday. Okay. Uh this won't be new by the time the the, the episode's released but it is new to me. And then we've got some qualifying. They're going to qualify. I'm not sure how they're going to do it. But they're going to do it. And then we race on Saturday um Saturday afternoon. I think there's even some heat races or something like that based on the schedule I saw. So going to get a lot of track time. It should be a lot of fun. I'll be watching it live like I always do. Yeah. Uh, do we have any inclination on what the track is going to look like? Whereas None. I know Crandon's got a rock section. It's got some pretty big berms. It's got, you know, it's got some fun stuff. Um, how does Bowling Green compare? Don't know. Um, and we didn't, and in <laughs> fairness, we didn't know about Crandon either because that was a completely new configuration when we went to it. They, gotcha. they diverted course for the ultra four guys that the pro fours, pro twos, the champ series, all that stuff didn't do. And then for us, we diverted off of one of the turns on the back of the short course and went back through the woods to another section that was not there last year uh, or the previous year. So that's something that they did and they added the rocks and all that. So that's why they did us practice. So from what I've seen of Bowling Green, it's just straight short track. Now, knowing ultra four, they're not going to let us do that. That's not going to happen. No, no, no. Because no, no. <laughs> the videos I've seen is just like this yeah. one short track, and then you kind of divert off of one of the straights into this little rock garden, and then you're back onto the straight. I don't see any way in this world that Ultra 4 lets us have it that easy. No, yeah. yeah. it's not going to happen. They've got to put something in there that can break you. Like, it just is what it is. So um, yeah. I, I expect it to be challenging. I expect it to be fast, just like it was uh, at Crandon. I expect the car. I expect the car to do well. Um, hopefully, I do well. I am very thankful that I had the track time that I had at Crandon, I learned a lot of things at Crandon and was still able to pull out two podium finishes. Very help. Very, very thankful for that. Hopefully we can replicate that. Maybe even instead of a two, three, maybe a one, two or a one, one or something like that. We're certainly going to be going for it. The car is certainly built well enough to do it. Um, And if Mm -hmm. a couple of things come together, we, we should be up there fighting, uh, fighting for that win as long as I can not have locked up break. So, um, so yeah, yeah, (laughs) we'll, we'll see, but, the the big part of that is race prep and yeah that's kind of what i wanted to talk about especially as it relates you know a lot of people don't realize what all we do to get the race car ready um versus you know what it would take probably to get it ready for a weekend reeling trip what how hard it is or how hard it's not it doesn't really matter and then kind of what we do you know weeks before the race months before the race 
the day before the mm-hmm. race, the day of the race, unfortunately, in in some conditions. So I think, you know, let's just have an episode. It happens all too soon. It, it, it happens all, all too, the time. Yeah. yeah, Literally all the time. I was just having this conversation with Adam at Rock Crawler yesterday. I'm like, you know, the stuff that we do, people just think, people would think we're dumb. But, like, the stuff that we've asked people to do, like, you know, the stuff that people think is crazy is like an average Tuesday for us. Right. And, and I'm not bragging about that. I'm saying that we're dumb. Like I'm saying we're those <laughs> idiots. Like we are not normal people. And that's not, and that's not bragging about it. Like we're seriously guys, we're not normal. Like I don't think we're that smart. Like we, we are missing some brain cells. Whatever's in most people's heads that says, Hey, don't do that. Or, you know, you should probably do this instead. I think with, with a lot of us guys, hardcore into this, that switch isn't there. We're just like, I, I think so. Most people I, see I, a I giant rock one, wall and they're like, oh, I better stop and turn around and go. We're like, I see a line. <laughs> I mean, how can I hit that at speed or come off at the other? Like, it's just dumb. Like, yeah, I don't know. I think to do this, though, I think to literally strap yourself into a race car, I think you have to be a little off in the head. A little bit. Um, Because you get in that car and, and you don't even think like, I guess if I sat there and thought about it, I, I it would scare me. Yeah. I, I, it should, but man, I just don't know that there's more fun you can have. No, it's a super like, calculated risk. And, but I, all of those things I, you got to yeah. turn off as soon as you put the helmet on. And, uh, but you don't, I don't think you have to, though. I think it just happens. As soon as the helmet yeah. goes on, it's all gone. Like I don't have yeah. to go and think, oh, I need to think about this or I need it. It just automatically yeah. happens. And I think that's how every single driver in any race series, I think that happens whether you're a pavement, um, you know, time trial guy whether you're a nascar driver f1 ultra four I, cart as you're a kid i think you just have to turn that off because if you if you're thinking about that you're losing yeah you, you can't you have to almost act you almost have to react instinctually and mm-hmm. and based on experience um which is where i like i don't have the experience but I'm, I'm getting it so but that's why you see these guys that have been doing it for years and years and years it's just so good they just mm-hmm. it's automatic Yep. They are on autopilot when they're out there based on their experience and knowledge and, and that wealth of experience they bring. And I got a lot of respect for it. I hope to be there uh, someday. Probably won't, but, you know, one can only hope. But um, but prep is a big, big, big part of that. And it is completely different from, you know, your weekend wheeling trip where you do what? You air down some tires and check some stuff. Like, that's pretty much it, right? Like what else maybe do you do? Maybe change the oil. Maybe. Maybe. I, I, I mean... Mm-hmm. I know what I do. I I mean, (laughs) I drop my tire pressures depending Mm -hmm. on where I'm at. I've dropped them as low as four or five. I've dropped them, you know, eight, nine, ten. I'd say eight to ten is probably average for me. Um, I used to go a lot lower than that. I actually think racing has made it to where I don't drop them as low. Now I'm thinking like ten to twelve. Yeah. Um, But, you know, you got to drop the tire pressures, uh, disconnect your sway bar. Mm -hmm. um, And then, I don't know, maybe you put it in the garage and do like a retork on, you know, your steering and control arms and shocks. And then you pack your cooler, make sure you got some food and some snacks, you know, got to get them snacks and drinks and check your radio. I get, I, I don't really think there's anything yes, else I do. I and if you're I'm driving like radio check, radio trail. check, that's about all I do. Yeah. But by the time I'm doing a radio check, I'm already on the trail. I'm like, we're already rolling. I'm like radio check. And hopefully, yeah. because so many times I've gotten on the radio check, nobody gets it back. And I'm like, ah, screw it. <laughs> yeah. I just won't hear and the chatter. Wheeling, right. And if you're willing locally, I mean, I would say more often than not, people just generally get in their Jeeps, drive to the trailhead, do a couple quick checks, air down and hit the trail. Um, I think you're right. There's not much, there's not a whole lot of prep involved in weekend wheeling or local wheeling. Uh, This is completely different. This I would equate to if you were planning, if you were planning to drive to Moab, wheel all week in Moab and drive home, what are the things that you would be checking and doing? Plus about 50 other things to get ready for a race. So let's start from, um, I guess let's start from, like kind of a high level stuff of what you look for and then get into the meat and potatoes of, of what that prep looks like for you. So every season we start with knowing we know how many races certain parts will go. You know, Mm -hmm. we know after one race, we change all of this stuff. After two races, we change all of this stuff. Every season, we change all of this stuff halfway through the season. And we have that all documented. That's all on checklist. That's all, that's all in writing. That's all on black and white. And three or four people have access to that. Um, uh, One lead tech, uh, I have access to that, another tech, and then, you know, the lead race car mechanic, and then another tech, and then Rob, the co-driver, um, has access to that. So we have that. We also have a pre-race checklist that gets gone over every single race. And then we have just kind of our generic checklist, like our pop-up checklist that comes up. 
you know, stuff like, oh, we need to have this or, oh, this messed up. We need to add this. So we have those those three checklists that we go over, two of those lists being um, every single race with one being the generic list that never gets changed. Um, the only thing that would change is our pressures on our list, which are front shocks, rear shocks, front tires, rear tires, front bumps, rear bumps. We do not mm-hmm. treat – this is one place where it differentiates between your average wheeler. We do not lump together the front and the rear. We, we differentiate between the front pressures and the rear pressures on – Shocks, bump stops, and tires. Some races, they're the same, like on tires. Never do I have a race where the front air bumps are the same pressure as the rear air bumps, and never do I have a race where the front shocks are the same pressure as the rear shocks. So KOH will have a different pressure sense. all the way across the board. Than, and obviously, I'm not going to share what those pressures are. But um, you can say they're firm. Like a race car is going to race somewhere between 26 and 32 on average. And different courses are going to be lower. Different courses are going to be on the higher end of that. That that would that's probably the biggest surprise to most people. That they're like, wait a minute, why aren't you not at like ten or twelve or fourteen? Like we would never go that low for one reason and one reason only: pinch flats. Um, when you get into a turn or you hit something at speed, that weight with that combination of that weight and that speed will pinch a tire so much that it will just like a pimple, man. It just pops it like a pimple. And obviously, we don't want pinch flats. Now, that being said, that is still the number one reason for tire failures, pinch flats. Because I, I can't run, I'm not going to run a tire at 40. Like, it's just not going to happen. And the race car weighs 56, 57, 50, 100 pounds. Like, there's only so much I can do. But, like with everything, we try to mitigate that. So, that's one thing I think that most people um, don't realize that we do is we actually repressure the shocks every single race. There are certain times, KOH, we did it twice. Um, desert races will do that. If we go out and we have long pre runs, we will actually repressure those shocks twice during a race week. I will pressure them up here at the race shop before it goes. We'll check those pressures before we pre-run, and then we will check them again and make adjustments for racing, usually the, the very last thing the night before the race or very first thing in the morning. And that just depends on, you know, if it's an afternoon race, we'll do it in the morning. If we're taking off first thing in the morning, we'll do that the night before. We just want to get that done within – eight to 12 hours of racing. So there's no time to bleed down. Cause it, it, ju- it does, it happens, yeah. right? It just does. Whether you want it to or not, pressures do bleed down. We are, we are asking a lot um, of these components a lot. So, you know, we'll run anywhere from, I'm going to give a wide range. Just so I'm not giving away any numbers, 200 to 300 PSI in the shocks, 200, to 300 PSI, and sometimes higher in the air bumps. You know, it all depends on, is it a short course? Are we jumping it? You know, we're going to have different pressures at Kentucky because we know we're going airborne. We know we're jumping the Jeep. Yeah. Like it's it's she forty six ninety nine airlines will be a thing, um, and we need to have those pressures a certain way, so that we can land the proper way, so that I'm not getting getting compression fractures in my back right. from launching a six thousand pound race car a hundred feet down the race racetrack. Because we're able to set it up, I'm able to do that consistently, lap after lap after lap, and I'm not injuring myself. Mm-hmm. And that is because of car setup, not because of my body. Um, if I didn't have it set up wrong, I would, ab- I could absolutely get injured because if you want to be competitive, if you want to run up front, you've got to hit some of these jumps at 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. You don't have the luxury of checking up and hitting a jump at 40, 45 to make it easier. You have to hit those things at speed. If anybody goes back and watches Crandon last year, I started right between, um, Bailey Cole and a Bronco and Lauren Healy and a Bronco. And I called up to the tower and I told Rob, I was like, look, I'm getting the whole shot on these guys. I'm using every single horsepower under this pedal. We're going. I'm floor pinning this thing. I had confidence that I was going to do it. I said, let me know the second I clear bumper so I can pick my line. Um, that that coming into that race course on that turn one is very, very dangerous at Crandon. Um, there has been wrecks there. There have been serious injuries there. There have been some bad stuff that happens there. I'm sure the 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 the, the significant others at home don't like me to say that, but it is very it's it's a land rush start. It's very dangerous. Um so my word to him was, look, I'm, I've got to be out front. I don't want to be back in the pack. I've got the horsepower to do it. We're on the front line. Let's go. And luckily, we were able to do that. And he called me, and I was able to get a line. But there's a cool picture where I'm like one car length in front of either Lauren or Bailey, and it's the three of us hitting the first jump on the, on the front stretch all at the same time. We're all airborne, and I'm like out front. And that was all because like, I just stomped on it. But we were hitting that at like 75, 80. And that was the small jump. The big jump, we were flying even further. So if you want to run up front, you've got to have that car dialed in to be able to do that stuff. This is not wheeling five, six miles an hour, seven, eight, being fast on your local trails. This is 
this is 10 times that speed in 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 the same vehicle built different right but the, but the same vehicle so we got to do things differently so definitely pressures would be one thing i think the amount of things that we check on our on our retorks uh we check everything we absolutely check everything every bolt we're checking sway bar links which stay connected on a race car we need sway bar control we have very 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 beefy sway bars especially in 4699 we have a gigantic sway bar in the rear um, especially helpful at tracks like Crandon to be able to get that car through center of turns and helps us get go off center on our roll off through the turns to be able to put the power down sooner because a half a second on a short course matters. A quarter of a second per lap matters. Um, so, you know, it's not like where it's a cage, like you said, where there's minutes and hours sometimes in between. You know, if you're minutes, you're done. Like it's over. Oh, that's, that's a short course, it's race. over. You, yeah. That you're, uh, you're two minutes the- down, you're done. Yeah. Uh, well, even to the point where at Crandon, if you lose a tire, typically you're out. Um, you're done. The amount of time it takes yeah. to change a tire is you're, you've already been lapped. Yeah. Um, you're not going to win. I mean, so you might not that, be lapped, but you're not, you're not winning. You're not winning. You're at the back Mm-mm. of the pack for sure. Uh, even to the point where I see a lot of people even pull their spare tires off at Crandon, A, for probably weight reduction, help you with get a little more centered on that jump, uh, but B, just because it's not needed. <laughs> Well, it's great. I'm sitting here looking. So I'm looking at the our standard pre registration I have it on my phone. It's a, basically a shared checklist between four people. And we just check everything. We check. I mean, we're checking the bolts on the hydro clamps. We're checking the fittings. We're checking the resi and the cooler mounts. We're checking the bolts to make sure they're tight on the mounts. And we're checking the mounts. Like, we're checking all that stuff. And we're checking the fittings. We're checking ball joints every single race. We're checking shock mounts. We're checking both sides of the track bar every single race. Not just the not just the jam nuts, but the actual mount bars. We're checking all the control arms, every bolt on every control arm, every jam nut. We're checking everything on the steering linkage. We're checking differential covers, sway bars. We have many, many, many bolts on those sway bars to keep them in there. It's not like your typical sway bar, and we're checking every single one of those bolts. We're checking every bolt on the drive shaft flanges, every single one of them. That's like 40 bolts almost. Um, we're checking all of those things. We're checking the straps on the rear, everything at the TK side. We're checking all every beadlock bolt gets checked at least twice through the course of a race week. Every one of them, even if they're tight, even if the first 40 are tight, we're still checking the other 80. And there's 26, I think, per wheel on what we've got, 24, 26. Well, so there's over 100 bolts that we're checking twice. We're checking tires, rear air bumps, front air bumps, tires, front and rear, rear shocks, front shocks. Then we have an entirely different checklist just for our recovery gear, just to make sure that our uh, for our tool bag. We have certain things that go in our tool bag. We have certain things that go in our recovery bag. We're checking every single one of those items. We're going over fueling procedures. We're checking to make sure that we have how much fuel do we have there? Do we have too much where it weighs too much? Okay, if we have a full tank, do we need to increase the pressures on the shocks to account for that when it's landing? Are we going to go out with a half a tank and we need to drop some pressure? All of those things matter because when you're racing, it's those things matter. And prep, races can be, they can't really be won in the garage, but they can absolutely be lost in the garage. hundred percent. They can be lost in a garage where, you know, when you're out wheeling, I mean, you're, it's a different thing, right? You're going five, six, seven miles an hour. You're not checking all those things. You're just not doing it. Like maybe you're really, really anal retentive and you do, but by and large, 99% of people going out wheeling, they're not going to do that. Cause you don't have to, I didn't do all that stuff on any Jeep. I'm not going to do that. You can't, I'm not going to roll up to Windrock and be like, yo guys, give me two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Give me two, two and a half hours and about yeah. six torque wrenches. Like, right. We're not going to do that. Um, so it's it's just a totally different deal. But then like when you go to a short course, now you got a whole other thing thrown in there because now you don't have to run a winch if you don't want to. If you can take your winch off your vehicle to get that weight down, yeah. you don't run a co-driver. I, don't have, I won't have a co-driver in the car with me. It's not allowed. We're not even allowed to have co-drivers. They have to stick up in the spotter's tower. So I'm still talking to him. It's still He's still in my head, um, but he's not in the car. Yeah, so so that changes things, mm-hmm. you know, taking a winch off that changes balance, changing your fuel load that changes balance, removing a, dr- a co-driver that changes balance. It all, it all makes little bitty differences in how the car feels. It will feel different. If I pitch it into a one eighty turn, if I have Rob in the car, a fuel tank of fuel and a winch on the front, than if I'm a half a tank of fuel, no winch on the front and no Rob in the car, it's going to feel different. And you know, you're either more likely or less likely to spin it. So if you're less likely to spin it, you can push the car a little harder. If you're more likely to spin it, you got to back off a little bit. And that changes based on 
the radius of the turn, how fast you're, you know, are you coming in fast because you had a nice speedway? Are you coming in off an S and you're coming in slow? Like all of that matters. And I'm certainly no maestro at that. I'm working on that to learn how to flow through S's, how to go from a fast straight to an inside, how to apex, you know, all that stuff. I know a little bit of that, but I'm certainly not a professional at it. Um, so, you know, I try to, I try to prep the car and come up with as much of the, you know, the mitigation stuff as I possibly can, because that's one thing I can control. I can't control what everybody else does on the racetrack. I can't control whether they water it right before we race or not. I can't, those are things I can't control. What I can control is what I do and then how we prep the race car. So we take race prep very seriously. I wouldn't, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know that we're quite to the level of Lauren Healy, Bailey Cole, Brad Lovell, those, the, the three Ford motor company Broncos. But I would say we're right behind that and probably take it more seriously than at least as seriously as the rest of 4,600, if not a little bit more. Um, just because, and, and some of it too is expect, like we, ex they, we expect to do well when we take that race car out. Um, it's a very powerful car. It's a very well-built car. Um, it has a lot of, of, of backing. Um, it's, you know, it, it's a good car and should run well. So we expect to do that. And so we have, to, our performance has to match. We try to match our performance as much as we can to the car. And, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that's prep for sure. For sure. And that prep is going to look different from between 4,600 drivers who are racing a full circuit versus they're only there for King of the Hammers. If you're only there for King of the oh, Hammers, yeah. you only got to prep really once a year. Uh, that prep may look vastly different than what you're doing. And the upkeep and the things that you're replacing are going to look very different just because of how often you're bringing that car out. Um, this year, you're looking at what, five, five races and then hammers. Well, it depends on how many you run. Um, yeah. But there was like, there's like 40 guys, 40 guys and girls that run the 4,600 class of hammers. But when you look at the schedule throughout the year, there's only like 10 to 15 that are consistent 4,600 racers. Some races will pop in here and there, but by and large, it's only about a third of the class that is like the actual competitive going for position, getting, trying to get that podium nationally. Uh, and if it's not a third, it's definitely less than half. Um, for sure. It's 45 to 50% are actually seriously out there racing the class race in, uh, race in and race out. So those are the guys, obviously, um, that you're, that you're racing against, but those are the guys who are going to take it seriously because even in 4699, if the only thing I was racing every year was KOH, the car would be, the car would be built different. Like it just, it just would be. And that was some of the issues that we had with it last year. The car was built to run KOH. It was not made to run 50, 60 miles an hour through the trees in Kentucky. What happened? We overheated the power steering. It wasn't built for that. Like that was not a thought of a full race season. So the first race out, we've got the field by 20 minutes. <laughs> and then, you know, we end up going, we, we let them, we kind of let them come back to us a little bit because we were taking it easy. And then when we said, okay, we got five minutes, we got to go. When we actually raced the car um, and we were zip zapping through trees, it overheated the power steering. I lost steering and hit a tree. It's just, it's just, it's just what it is. So lesson learned. It's fine. We figured it out. The electronic issues that we had kind of raised their rear, they kind of reared their head a little bit when we got into a full season of racing, you know, so we figured that out. And that's what we spent last year doing was like, okay, now this car has to go out and it has to race everything. It has to race the rocks. It has to race the desert. It has to race short track. It has to race wet, crappy stuff in the East coast. It has to do all of this. We need to look at, we need to look at doing things differently. So it's, it's a lot different underneath that car this year. Um, mm -hmm. Steering suspension got, got updated and changed a little bit. Axles got changed. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we changed with an eye on how we were going to race it um, this right. year. Cause we couldn't really do that last year. It was too late. Uh, we we kind of got what we got, mm -hmm. um, but we had the off season um, this year to get it right. So, you know, we were able to do that. Yeah. So what does it look like? You, you mentioned, um, what you do per race, every race. Um, so what are we looking at every couple races twice a season or once? And a I season? can't give away all the prep secrets. Ah, um, you got to give us a little bit. So though. things that are on the list are filters and fluids. Um, and those vary, but you know, we don't, there's not a lot of fluids or filters that make it through a season. It, it just doesn't, it's just not a thing. Um, some things will end up getting replaced basically via checks you know, we're checking something and I don't like it. So we just change it. Um, that, that happens a little bit. Generally our schedule replaces parts generally before you would actually need them replaced 
because we want to run that car as up to date and as, as fresh as possible. So we will replace things um, unless we're doing specific testing for a company. We will replace stuff. You know, some companies come out, you know, we, we're trying to run a, you know, there's a joint from rock crawler that we're running on the race car. Now we're going to race it all season. Um, you know, our frame side joints on the long arms, we're racing it all season um, because, well, it, we know it can do it. It's been on other race cars, but you know, Jeremy at rock car was like, look, you're not going to need to change this. You got, it's not a problem. Like race it all season. Okay, cool. We'll check them. We'll absolutely check them. Um, but you know, I've had, you know, we've got that confidence in rock crawlers parts, obviously, where we're going to be able to run that all season. Now, if I did damage one or something happened, obviously we'll change that. We're not going to push it to an unsafe level or to create some kind of mechanical disadvantage because we don't replace something that needs to be replaced. But, um, you know, height Ram hydros are something we look at lines, fuel lines, power steering lines, all of that stuff gets checked. If we notice a fray or a nick in anything, it's gone. Like it's out of there. Um, we don't, you know, coolant will, you know, in a, in a, in a daily driver, coolant stays in your vehicle for years, 60, 70, hundred thousand miles. Um, ours generally stays in less than a thousand miles. Same thing with power steering fluid. Same thing with brake fluid. You know, we're not, we're not even running these cars a thousand miles a year or may, eh, maybe about a thousand miles a year. When you talk about pre-running and racing, you're talking about a thousand to 1500 miles a year tops. And we're changing those fluids out at a minimum we're changing them out. Oil gets changed. You know, we're checking that oil. The oil starts to get black. It's out. It's out. If we do a long desert race and I think it looks black, it's gone. Like we're not going to not, we're not going to not change something. We are going to be more overly cautious with things like that. Filters, fluids, lines, belts, hoses, all that stuff. You know, not all of that stuff is going to make it through a season where if you're talking about yeah, a wheeling season, hit me. that stuff's going to last two, three, four, five wheeling seasons or, or the entire, you know, your coolant might stay in your Jeep the entire time you own the Jeep. Or your Bronco or your Forerunner mm-hmm. or whatever, you're never going to change that. It's like hundred thousand mile coolant. Why would you change right. it? Um, we're not only changing it, we're adding, we're putting in additives. You know, we're doing everything we can do to make that car run as cool as possible and keep wear down on that engine. Where, you know, a weekend wheeler is not. You're not going to have those. You're not going to have those concerns. So there's not. No. There's really not a square inch of that car that doesn't get seen or touched on a given race weekend, or in the days leading up to prep see you know as we film this episode you know we're going to be racing next week we're filming this episode early because the race car is going in monday and tuesday of next week to get final prep we did three days on it a couple weeks ago to get stuff changed out from koh and we changed out the armor the new stuff from next venture motorsports we changed out the rear bumper uh we changed out a bracket on the pow no we changed out the entire track bar bracket that we had the issues with at koh we had those pieces cut we bent them we welded them we fabricated that we made it we put it on the car it is now there and it is, I think, pretty sexy. Um, when we were in there, Rob, we actually brought Rob in from Tennessee to work on the race car for three days straight. That's all he did for three and then four days. Um, he ended up finding a bracket that got bent on the lower control arms. So those have been overnighted. Those are coming. Um, rock crawler suspension sending those. Um, thanks to Adam Collin, got, got me taken care of there at Rock Crawler. When I told him what was going on, he goes, Yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've already got a set boxed up. I'm printing out a shipping label now, it's on the way. So next Monday and Tuesday, we're going to be doing our final shop stuff. So a full, complete front to back retorque, full, even though we're going to do it again, we're going to do it anyway. Uh, we're going to check every fluid, change any fluid that needs to be changed since KOH. We're going to go over every filter, every line, every hose, every belt, and then we will change up. We are going to cut off those front lower control arm mounts that are on the curry axle. We're going to cut those off and weld the new rock crawling ones on there. They're a little bit higher clearance. Um, so we're going to cut those mounts off, put weld new ones on, paint that up, and then we're going to do a full check. We will also check all tire pressures. It will load onto the race trailer completely prepped. But then it all gets done again in Kentucky. <laughs> we will do it all again on either Friday night or Saturday morning. All of it. It'll all get done again. Yeah, because it, it yeah. definitely matters. And like you said, prep might not win your race, but it'll yep. definitely win And we take race. extra... We take extra um, control arms. We take extra tie rods. We take extra drag links. Mm-hmm. We take extra drive shafts. We take extra all the fluids, belts, everything we have. This is why I have a one race car that goes in a 36-foot enclosed race trailer with a full toolbox on board um, is because of this. We want, we <clears> need to need be, yeah, you got to be prepared for the mm-hmm. worst. And I would never, ever think about taking that much crap to Windrock. Ever. I wouldn't no. do that. <laughs> you probably get laughed at. Or any of that. You're going to get laughed. You're going to get, yeah. yeah. get laughed off the trail. Like, you're not going to do that. You're going to be called some kind of trail beauty or something, right? So, 
Um, yeah, you would never do that, but it's it's overkill. But for those who've never raced, they don't they're not going to understand that. Come to one race and sit in the pits, and you understand why we do that. What we do to these cars is brutal. <laughs> It is. Absolutely. What we ask these race cars to do, and and by extension, our own bodies. I wish I could get retorks on my body on Friday night. Um, <laughs> is insane. And when you feel yeah. that car doing that at speed for hours upon hours, you you, it makes sense. Then you're like, yeah, of course, I'm going to recheck everything. Yeah, of course, I'm going to check everything well, like, again. Right, Dan said from uh, Next Venture, in the course of a couple hours at King of the Hammers, you are putting more fatigue on the vehicle and your body than most vehicles will see an entire lifetime of Absolutely. wheeling, even if they're wheeling every single mm-hmm. weekend. Um, and within the course of of a heavy race like Hammers, you're going to see that all that at one time. And then I would definitely say within the course of a couple regional uh, Ultra 4 races, you're seeing what more than any, any daily drive or any weekend warrior is going to see in the lifetime uh, of their vehicle. Uh, something else I want to kind of mention, though, that you haven't touched on yet is your safety gear. Um, safety gear has expiration dates as well. Yes. So let's talk about how long your harnesses, your seats, your helmet, your Hans, stuff like that. How long do those last usually? Usually a couple to a few years, depending on the piece of gears, two to three years. Something like four years is about the max on stuff. And everything that we have is mandated by FIA and USAC to have labels stitched on them. So. My helmet has a date printed on it. Um, my um, harness straps have a date certification tag and date tag sewn onto the straps. Same thing with my fire suit. Same thing. My socks have a tag sewn onto them. Um, my gloves, seats, um, all of that stuff. And all of that stuff, Hans device, um, all of that stuff gets checked every race. So even though kind of king of the hammers is like, if you haven't had your car teched before you have to have it teched and they go over everything, like everything, regardless of whether you have to do that or not, based on the last time you had your, your, your chassis certification, you still have to go through either tech tech and or contingency. It's called different things at different races, but it's basically the same thing where safety stuff is getting checked. Everything from personal safety gear, um, helmets, Hans shoes, shoes in some cases, um, underwear, your base layer, your fire suit, your gloves, your harnesses, seat, all that stuff. Your um, even our window nets have dates. You know they're clearly printed right there on the window net. All of that stuff gets checked. Vehicle safety gets checked, i.e., fire extinguishers. Um, luckily for that, we have H3R Performance. We're covered there. We have three H3R Performance uh, fire extinguishers on board. Uh, they're checking your. Do you have your safety triangles? If you need to put triangles out, if you wreck somewhere, you you break down somewhere on track, whatever. First aid kit. We have to have a first aid kit readily available to either driver or co-driver in the compartment or immediately behind it where we can reach it. So all of that stuff is getting checked. Our lights, lights safety gets checked. You know, are you, are your, is your light bar running? All that kind of stuff. You know, at KOH, you have four different sections. You know, at section one, they check this. At section two, they check this. Section two. Most of the other races, it's just all done at one. There's no contingency aspect to it. Um, although sometimes there is. You know, if there's a big, you know, Crandon was a little different where they put everybody on you know, Main Street and all that. But at Crandon, we were also able to go into the Ultra Foyer and kind of get our own tech. So tech and or contingency. Contingency is basically where fans can watch us do all that stuff. Straight tech is where we're just doing, through, we're just going through tech. But it's really all the same stuff checked. We're just not going through full chassis certification again. But safety stuff absolutely is checked every single race. And and USAC don't play. <laughs> USAC don't play, boys. And they shouldn't. They absolutely shouldn't. It's dangerous. No, your your life quite absolutely depends racing on is it. dangerous. Um, and any I've seen a couple. I'm a part of a couple of groups uh, within Ultra Four just because I've had the bug um, of the idea of maybe one day the LJ turns into a race car. I'm not even close to anywhere being near that. But to get the idea now of what I could do now if I wanted to go that route, I've joined those groups, and I've seen a lot of people ask like oh, well, I've got this and this is a couple of years old or where can I save money? Or, I bought this used. And I'm like, why would you do that? I get it. It like racing is not a budget friendly thing. I don't care what level of racing you are at. It's not a budget thing. And when you're doing this kind of racing, actually with any kind of racing, there's very much an inherent risk to it. And like your life quite literally depends on the safety gear, the harnesses, the Hans, your helmet, all of those things. So like, 
yes, it costs money. It costs a lot of money, but it's there to protect you. And so good for them for being strict and checking all those dates and making sure that you guys are not just some podunk racing crew that potentially could get somebody killed. Um, so good for you, Sack. Honestly, I know some people have their complaints. Like, oh, it's so strict. Good. Well, you're, you're alive. Because you bring up a good strict. point with the kind of different levels of racing, and that's true. There are definitely two distinct levels, and and to an extent, three levels of racers within a given class. There are what they affectionately refer to as the hobby racer. Um, for any race car driver watching this, they know exactly what I'm talking about from the drivers' meeting last year uh, in Oklahoma. There is the hobby racer that is going to do it on as much of a budget as possible. And they're not really there. They know they're not there to win. They're there to race. They love racing. They have a passion for it. They love it. They love building the cars. They love whatever piece of it they love. It's enough for them to get out there and race. And, and they, don't expect, they don't expect to win, but they want to go out there and they want to have a good time. And they're there for that. And I have no problem with it. We, we don't have a race series without those kind of racers. And then there's the other level, which is really broken up into two uh, subsections, which is kind of the competitive racers. And there's two levels of competitive racers. There's competitive racers that unless something really goes their way, they're not winning. Like they're not on the podium unless something goes their way. They want to compete and they take it seriously. And I have a endless respect for that. But for whatever reason, um, car age, car build, whatever, horsepower, whatever, they're not going to be competitive unless something happens. Now, it's racing. You never know. And mm -hmm. I've seen it happen many, many times where every single top contender is knocked out of a race. And here comes Joe Bob. And a car that was like, huh? <laughs> but he was more consistent that day. He didn't break. He wasn't doing anything. He wasn't putting his car through as much, going as fast. And and all the fast guys broke. It happens. It happens yeah. more than people want to. I mean, I mean, it happens, man. Um, there's a reason, you know, Mick Henson's got about eight and a half horsepower on a good day. <laughs> but the dude yeah. is consistent and he is a freaking wheel man. Oh, yeah. One of the, Dude's I mean, awesome. you're. Man, you put him in 4699 or you put him in one of those Broncos, dude, that dude's it. fighting for a national championship. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 100%. The dude's a driver. Um, and there are other guys just like him. Alex Fleming, driver. Now, he's got a V8 under the hood of his forerunner, but good, just a great driver. Um, John Rance, again, it's a Bronco, but it's an off-the-lot Bronco. Great mm -hmm. driver. But, again, unless – now, he's kind of – now he's a little higher up in the, in the conversation because he's brought that Bronco up. Mm -hmm. But – you know, the older car guys, no, they're, they're not going to be favorites to win. You're not going to give them short odds to win a race. But if they, but Mick is so good at keeping that car together and he knows every stinking square inch of that car, every bent and broken piece of metal and, <laughs> and every Cheeto that holds his tailgate together, there's <laughs> right. something to be said for that. that, that that's yeah. big, right? And it mm -hmm. proves out because who did we lose out third place to last year by eight points on the national? McKinson. And that was because of Kentucky. Kentucky was 10 points. Had we, not, had we not had the issues we had in the race car, we would have been in third. Same thing. I could have said that with many other races. But that happened to us. And it didn't happen to Mick. Or it didn't happen to Mick as often. So, and Mick won that race. Uh, Mick won that race because while we were on the side broken, he passed us. And we ended up with a third and he ended up with a first. That's 10 points. So, or more. Um, so, consistency is, is key. And, you know, he works on that car himself and, you know, he's probably one of, I talk about him cause he's probably one of the dudes, him and probably Sergio Panilla. Pan, I want to say it Panilios just because that's how Miles says it. That's Pinios, how they say it. I'm, I'm pretty Sergio sure it's Panilios. It's Panios. The, the double L makes a yes sound. Yeah. The Peruvian <laughs> prince. Um, but it is Panios. But I, know, I love how they say Panilios or Panelos or whatever, but, <laughs> but him and Sergio it's are two of the guys race. that I respect. Cause you look at what they did in cars that shouldn't mm -hmm. have done it. You know, right. 4688 absolutely. was a winning car a long time ago. Sergio brought it out of retirement and and absolutely and won races with it. Like that's impressive. Yeah. And it is equally it's it is impressive on the car, but it's equally as impressive on the driver. And mm -hmm. and having having him on my team and understanding some of the issues that he had to overcome in some of those races, mm -hmm. it, it just makes it that much more impressive. I mean, yeah, Oklahoma absolutely. when he won, he didn't even know he was in the lead. He was singing the wheels <laughs> on the school bus, singing about ice cream cones. Because he had no uh -huh. comms. His comms were broken. So he mm -hmm. was just like, F it. It was a Sunday drive for him. <laughs> it, was. it was. It was a fast Sunday. We all know what Sergio really means when he says, I'm just going out for a Sunday cruise. That means he's floor pinning it. We all know this, Sergio. Okay? You're not fooling anybody anymore. 
And now, look at right. it. Now he's in 4655. That's going to be a car that competes for the national championship this year. That's yeah, going to be a contender. There, sure. I look forward to being on course with him all year long. We just talked oh, a couple yeah. days ago Man, with I our can't plan. Watch you guys because we do run together. Out. We're a team. We we run together under under RK and One Racing. Um, we camp together. We prep together. We do a lot of stuff together. We eat together. Um, we do all that stuff together every every single race. Um, we are we are teammates. So I look forward to doing that. I've seen that car. I know some of the stuff they did to it to make it even better to avoid some of the the bugs and issues that are that are bound to come with a new car. Um, but I know he's doing it right now. He took it out a week or so ago to get some seat time in it. And I know that they're going to be doing some prep on it too. I mean, Sergio was famous for mm-hmm. doing no prep racing on 4688, but that was a different car. That was a different, was car. A different car. This is a car built in conjunction with, with Rock Crawler. This is a car that's got, you know, marketing, marketing ties to Jeep. You know, the Jeep logo, mm-hmm. Jeep, there's only one. It's on the side of the car. So there's some expectations that come with that. Fortunately or unfortunately, say it as you want. There are some expectations that come with that. So I, I can uh, I can tell you there will be some prep. I know that this is the first year I've ever heard Sergio care about tires. You know, I had some Nitto tires left over. Of course, we run Mickey Thompson now, and I was like, "Look, you need you, if you need tires, I got you." He's like, "Yeah, bring the tires. We we need the tires. Yeah. We need to have those there." Yeah, he's getting serious. Now, it's getting serious. Saying. Yeah, like last year, it was it was he had a lot of good he had a lot of fun, but it was more fun because nobody expected it. <laughs> Right. Now we have expectations. And I think there's expectations on us too. I don't think everybody had a ton of expectations on me last year only because I was the new guy. And yes, I had a car and that helped for sure in some races. Uh, there were some races where the horsepower really didn't matter. And I think I would have finished the same with a 2-0. Um, but Crandon, Crandon absolutely helped. I would not have finished where I did locking up brakes without 650 horsepower or whatever, 625 horsepower. Wouldn't have happened. So it certainly helped. And it certainly gave me confidence knowing that I had that type of vehicle but i think definitely this year the expectations have been ratcheted up and with a disappointing at least for me i was disappointed with how koh went i know a lot of other people said i shouldn't have been um i was i was disappointed um anytime you don't cross the finish line i don't care if it is koh i I just don't care i was disappointed so for me i've got some unfinished business that i need to take care of the rest of the year and and the expectations are they're ratcheted up this year they are they for whatever for better or for worse, for good or bad, whether they should be or they shouldn't be, I think everybody's operating on. And I know that Lauren even called Sergio a couple weeks ago and asked him if he was going to be racing at Kentucky. <laughs> Look, guys, I mean, it yeah. matters. Well, like, that's, it's the competition. That's what's good, though, is, yeah, healthy competition breeds healthy competition. So if 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 everyone as a whole is is upping up their prep game, upping their racing game, if, if everyone's getting dialed in, it's going to make the competition that much closer, but it also separates the guys who are serious from the guys who are hobbyists, which I think there should be a separation in there. Um, anyways, there but there's a, there's one last thing that we haven't talked about that I would like. I mean, it's something I'm sure a lot of people don't think about going into this is um, body prep health. Um you kind of you wish you said you wish you had to retune and retwork on your body every 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 race. But uh, is there anything that you're doing with your body, your diet, workout routine, IV fluids, chiropractor visits, anything like that that it do you take into consideration for the race season? Uh, yes, unfortunately, last season I was not able to do very much. I was not cleared by my doctor to do it after having so 2022. I spent some time in the hospital. I spent a lot of time, months in recovery from an ankle surgery where I destroyed my left ankle. Um, and I destroyed my right knee after that. So, um, it wasn't until basically it was almost the end of the season last year where the doctor said, look, you can, okay, you're good to work into stuff and you can do, you can do whatever you want. So I finally was able to start doing stuff. Rob started doing a bunch of CrossFit and stuff like that to get ready for KOH. And he, he took off a bunch of weight and got his cardio up. Um, I am now doing the same. I've been cleared. So I'm, yeah, I do, I do at least once a week chiropractor visits for adjustments. Um, I do um, some physical therapy. That will probably be hopefully ending a little bit with the knee and the ankle. As as that gets stronger, I do some definite, some specific stuff for that. And um, now that I'm back doing that, especially for this season, yeah, you got to, you know, you change the diet. Um, you definitely, you know, the week before the race. So starting on Monday, generally anything but you know, basically water and or flavored water or just straight black coffee is out of the diet. It's just gone. Um, and you start doing, you know, different foods a little bit. You go a little bit straight. Uh, for me, I car, I start doing just, I'm not a big salad guy. So I do a little more like clean carb and protein type stuff, but you're not eating stuff. You know, you're not eating junk food. You're not eating crap. Um, for me, 
I needed to do it anyway because I needed to get back in the shape that I was before my injuries. Um, so my play, I, I sh- I'm hoping to be back kind of middle of the season and be ready for be ready for nationals. But Rob did the same thing, and he's he got a he got a few months head start on me, um, and he's been doing awesome with it. But yeah, like I feel like last year, especially the beginning of the year, coming off of those injuries, I was not my engine was not there. And, you know, luckily I had a co-driver. It's more important for the co-driver for sure, I think, um, who's getting in and out of the car, who's running around, who's doing all that. Um, the big thing from a driver's standpoint is mental because, and, and I have felt this before, you get to the end of a long race, your decision-making, uh, if you're not right, can be diminished. Um, your, your patience, your mental focus, what you can deal with to where you, cause you get in that race car and at the end of the race, you can just be, uh, I'm, I'm done. Like, dude, don't talk to me. I don't want, if you're not right, electrolyte levels, vitamins, uh, hydration, mm-hmm. your brain changes. The brain chemistry the changes for sure. And things that I would never care about talking to you, recording a podcast or things that now I'm bitching about. Like you just, and, and you see it after a race and it happened to me once last year. And I was like, that's why I wasn't hydrated. I know I, I was not hydrated enough. I was not adding electrolytes. I, w- I knew what I was, I knew where I messed up. So I stopped doing that. Mm-hmm. And, I, and towards the end of KOH, I felt I was getting that way because we didn't, I didn't have enough electrolytes. I don't think, but it was a long day. You know, it was already dark. We'd been in the race car almost 12 hours at that point. Uh, we had been in the race car 12 hours at that point. I don't sure there's much you can do <laughs> um, from that standpoint. So yeah, mentally for sure for me as a driver with a little bit on the physical, and then absolutely co-driver has to have it all has to have, you know, co-driver is a tough job. I did it. It's hard. It's not easy. You gotta, you gotta be there physically start to finish. You are that equilibrium for the driver. Mm -hmm. Um, We as drivers tend to be drivers tend to be prima donnas a little bit and, and a little extra. And the co-driver has to be there to kind of keep that in check. Um, And, and it happens. And, and, you know, we had one race last year where I was, I was all over Rob, man. I was all over him. I didn't like what he was doing. I didn't like he always calling stuff. And I jumped his ever loving crap. Um, some of it was deserved, and I think he would admit that. Um, but I was in his ass, man. I really was. And and because it just was not performance to the level that I wanted. It was a race that I felt we should have been competing for the win. We ended up getting a third. Um, and and I just didn't, I was not a fan. Now, you know, it was Rob's first year co-driving, and I was hard on him. And but after that race, we talked about it and I said, look, this is where this is why I said that this is where it needs to be done. This is where we need to make corrections. And I'll be damned if he wasn't corrected in 100 percent on his game for KOH. So right. it's not yeah. all sunshine and lollipops and roses in that race no. car. Um, it is definitely, definitely not. not for family ears consumption. <laughs> we I have let yeah. him have it. He has defended himself at times. But at the end of the day, we're there to compete and competing is not. If you're there to be competitive, you're not there for, it's not there for fun. Fun is if you're competitive and do well. Um, it's not fun if you're there to be competitive and you suck. Losing, being slow and, and, and last, it, that's not fun. There's no fun. There. I don't care. There's no fun. Unless, again, you're, unless you're there for the hobby and then you're just there to, to be there. Um, but we're not. So, um, you know, mental for me, definitely physical and mental for him. And you, we absolutely do things. There are things that I do that are specifically because I race, for sure. Yeah. Hundred percent. Sure. Well, I think I think that's all I've got to cover. Um, I can't think of anything else prep wise, unless you got some stuff you want to talk about some more. Uh, no, I think we covered it. I mean, it's just it's just that uh, you know, everybody watches racing. I think, and I did this to an extent. Everybody watches whatever, anything professional. You know, you watch a professional sport, you watch racing, you watch anything. You think it's not that hard, or I could do that, or mm-hmm. if I only this. And I'm and I'm here to tell you, no. <laughs> Without <laughs> a lot of other people without a lot of other help, without a lot of training experience, you're not, you're not just going to jump in Lauren Healy's race car and drive it like Lauren Healy. It's it's not going to happen. You're not going to jump in 4699 and drive it like me. Not with not, not now that I have hundreds of a couple hundred hours of seat time. It's just not going to happen. Um, right. You know, could you get in a race car tomorrow and start getting better? Absolutely. But while you're getting better, so am I, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just like with Lauren, I can get in a race car and maybe I'm as good in five years as Lauren is now. But during those five years, Lauren's be better getting better too, <laughs> right? So you right. know you've got to be aware of that, and that doesn't mean that somebody's unbeatable. It's not true. Like go watch any race series other than F one. Um, <laughs> other, we have to make that caveat. 
yeah. you know, it's not like you're getting one guy winning every race in a season. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't right. happen in NASCAR. It doesn't happen in Ultra Four. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in most races uh, that are built with any kind of rule book that's there for um, parity. Um, when the cars have any kind of parity, then the dri- and the driver matters. You're just not going to see that. Um, and, and and it's no different. It's no different in Ultra Four. It may look different, but it's no different. So um, that is one thing. It is it is not like it is a thousand percent not like building your Jeep Wrangler and taking it out to Windrock. It's not or taking it out. It couldn't be not. any further from, from it that. It could yeah. not be further. I know the forty six ninety nine looks like a Wrangler. I know that. And I know that there are some Wrangler esque things on it. I get that. It's not a Wrangler. It's not. <laughs> it is no more a Wrangler than Bailey Cole's Bronco is a is a Bronco anymore. It's right. just it's that not. far separated. It's Which, just that far good separated. Reason. But that's as much for performance as it is for safety, right? Like there's things that we have to do electrically, fuel delivery, safety, cage, seating, all that stuff that has to be in a race car, and just that stuff alone makes it different not aside not not even including all of the other stuff that makes it different so i would i would say don't let the looks deceive you um it's 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 a lot different um than some would think and um i'd say if you do think you're that good man build a race car and come on out go out like i'm not even saying Sport that to challenge music. people like i you know we 4600 no. i think is the spirit of ultra four racing we yeah. by and large we all get along like we do Yep. Like we'll help each other. Like I was giving tires to um, Darren or Derek from um, in his FJ. You know, I was giving him tires to use on race day. I'm given, I've given Sergio tires before I've had spares for other people. Like the other people have helped me. I got nicked for expired seatbelts last year at Crandon. I ran with Mick Henson's coast drivers harness. People don't know that. Like Mick was no problem. Mick was like, absolutely go get it. No problem. Whatever you need. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just the kind of guys that are out there. The guys and girls, we got females too. That's just the kind of girls and guys and gals that are out there racing in 4,600. Now, mm-hmm. granted when, when the visor goes down, we're competitors. Absolutely. But when the visors aren't down, we, we, you know, a lot of us are friends and at least at the very least mm-hmm. we're friendly and we're not, you know, jerks to each other and we want to help each other as much as possible i'd rather beat you on the track than off the track i want to race you i want to beat you out there not in here so and i think every i think by and large every driver feels that way regardless of class i've heard it said over and over and over again and i believe it i believe i feel that way for sure (sighs) is that it we're done. I think it's it. I think it's it. <laughs> <laughs> that was a hell of a good episode. Well, uh, I know you had kind of talked about an hour in. You know, you're like, I don't know. Can we make this a full episode? I'm like, man, I think we can. I think we can, and think we did. We did, and we did. So, <laughs> kudos to us, and kudos for right. all of you for sticking around and listening to us, um, throwing out this. But it was time. I mean, we got the race coming up again. Yeah. Some people are going to be watching it's this. A good subject matter. Yeah, it, you know, we're right there. We're right there. We're filming this the week before. We'll release it the week of the race. But like right mm-hmm. now, man, it's crunch time, man. It's the race season yeah. is going. We've got we've got Kentucky coming up. Then we've got Badlands. We've got I gotta look back at the schedule. It's been changed, but you know, it's mm-hmm. it's time now. It is time to go yeah. racing. KOH was KOH was good. We did what we did, but that part is over, and now we get into the season. Now we yeah. get into where the championship is won and lost in the in the real, you know, the real races. There are no there are no more double points races this year. Mm-hmm. It's all every race matters just as much as KOH did. So we got to go out there and we got to go out there and get it done. We got to go out there and do the work and, sure. and get it done. And hopefully, hopefully we can do that. And um, obviously no matter how we do, we'll have a wrap up episode. We'll talk about the race. Um, if there's a lot to talk about, we'll make it an episode. If not, we'll just make it a, a mailbag and answer some questions about racing. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. Um, we do have um, our, another episode coming, our interview with Andy Perry or my interview with Andy Perry. Um, good guy from steer smarts. there talking about steer smarts. Um, and him and their company look forward to getting that out there. Um, that's something that'll be out in the future as well as the ultra four wrap up. So that is where we will leave it for today. Again, everyone, thank you coming. very much for coming along on this ride with us, for listening, for watching wherever that may be, whether it is on Spotify, we are on Google play. We are on Apple podcast. We are on the outlaw off-road.com on the dirt to dust section. Got the most recent three episodes there. And then of course we are on YouTube if you choose to see what you hear. Uh, I'm not sure why you would do that, but hey, whatever. We appreciate it. Do not forget, please, please, please do not forget to like. Do not forget to comment. Do not forget to subscribe. Hit that button. 
if you are on YouTube and or all the podcast stuff too, to let you know when we've got new episodes coming out, which we do every Wednesday uh, for our long format full episodes and, and on Friday, which are generally our mailbags and our special edition episodes. We have a special episode. We will release that on Friday. So that is where we'll leave it for this week. Again, thank you all for coming along. Caleb, thanks again for doing what you do, man. Just doing what you do. I appreciate it. I you, would Doug. probably veer off course <laughs> way more than I already do without you there to, uh, you're kind of my lane departure warning with steering assist. <laughs> Get the steering assist. It's try. annoying. I want to turn I off try. the steering assist, but in this case, I need it. So grateful to have that here. Um, that's where we'll leave it. Appreciate everybody stopping by, and we will see you next week on Dirt to Dust. You've been listening to Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off Road, the premier off road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it. (laughs) 